אונליין. אונליין. אונליין ביי ג'ילטור? יס. פרפקט. או, אקסלנט. אוקיי. אני יכול לראות את הצ'אט, זה עובד. כן? אתה רואה? אתה רואה? אתה רואה? אתה רואה את
National Association from Africa, the Americas, Europe, Asia Pacific, and the Middle East. Our mission as landscape architect is to create globally sustainable and balanced living environment for the benefit of humanity worldwide. If I connect with the profession of landscape architect globally, specifically if I have a number of core objectives to establish the first, to establish, develop and promote the profession, uh, discipline and education of landscape architecture, combined with this with this diverse range of art and science on an international basis. Second, to establish, develop and promote the highest standard of education and professional practice influencing the widest range of landscape architecture operation. Third, to develop and promote international exchange of knowledge, research, skill, and experience in all matters related to landscape architecture across all cultures and communities. IFLA developed its objective through committees, permanent committees, and working groups. IFLA has four international standing committees, education and academic affairs, professional practice and policy, communication and external relation, and the financial and business planning committee, which drive, coordinate, and deliver initiative policies and program across its memberships. These standing committees have an elected chair who represent them on our executive committee, as well as representative from each of our five regions. Each committee has a number of working groups which focus on particular topics central to profession. For example, climate change and agric agricultural landscape, whose presidents are with us today. These working groups have individual elected chairs as well as regional representatives to ensure a global perspective is applied to their work. A little bit about IFLA Americas. IFLA, IFLA America is working on three objectives that are transversal to the reality of Latin America and North America. Education, governance, and professional practice. You can see our objective in more detail on your screen. We invite you to join IFLA's work through its IFLA member National Association. And a special invitation to our friend of ASLA, IFLA is hopefully to build bridge across the region. Thanks for your attention. Now, uh, finally, now I present to you all of you to Pedro Camarena from Mexico. Pedro is the chair of the IFLA R Standing Committee on Professional Practice and Policy. Pedro will offer a brief introduction to the conference and will also introduce our guest. Go ahead, Pedro. Your your microphone is in mute. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, now is are you hearing me? Okay. Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. This is a very exciting exercise. We are trying to connect people, uh, most of them landscape architects, from the whole continent, from Canada to La Patagonia, passing through Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Mexico City, Jose Costa Rica, Colombia, Uruguay, Chile, and every country in this amazing land, North, Central, and South America. So here we are, landscape architects, totally enclosed, planning the territory, designing the open space, fields, urban public space, but from our home, in total confinamiento. Thinking about what the future holds for us, if there will be some job opportunities, what kind of opportunities, when and how will we return to the new reality in this profession? 
There are plenty of questions. Many, many webinars are flooding the website in this virus issue. Many people trying to reach each other as we did normally at the classroom, but unfortunately, it is not the same. And this is why, and this is the reason we invite you, all of you, to share with us what are you thinking about right now? What do you think about the near future? Um, thank you very much for being here. For sure, this will be very useful for everyone. It is very important to hear all of you and to be able to sow some ideas that I hope will germinate soon. Uh, well, first, I would like to propose a basic agreement to be able to conduct this meeting well. First, I will try to make the CV presentation very fast because we don't have a lot of time. I apologize in advance if I omit relevant information. Second, I kindly ask you to speak slow and clear because we have a large Spanish speaking audience. Uh, third, this is more an informal talk, so feel free, feel comfortable and feel, and feel confident. It is just about generate uh, first fresh communication, uh, virtual communication between us, the landscape architects of the whole continent. Please, uh, the fourth is please turn off the microphones to avoid external noises. And finally, uh, I can say that the, the audience can make questions and send it by chat, uh, this chat available at the YouTube platform. And then uh, later, uh, Gloria Ponte will read it to the speakers. Uh, so thank you very much, all of you. Thank you very much for being here. And uh, let me introduce our first guest, Dr. Colleen Mercer Clark from Canada. Um, Dr. Mercer Clark is an interdisciplinary scientist specializing in adv advancing resilience and encouraging transformation through the delivery of useful science on climate change and adaptation to communities, business and governments. In 2012, she was appointed to the National Advisory Committee on Coastal Assessment at the Climate Change Directorate of Natural Resources in Canada, and also served as one of the primary authors uh, for the 2000 uh, Science basis and, and she's sorry, currently she is an advocate for ecosystem based approach to planning and design for the continued strengthening of efforts to protect and sustain the natural our natural world. She was former president for CSLA, the Landscape Architecture Canadian uh, Society in 2003 to 2004. And, and she's also served us on a range of national boards, executive and local and national advisory committees related to coastal and ocean management and to broader conservation goals. Currently, she serves as a chair of the professional practice and politics on the International Federation of Landscape Architects, IFLA. In fact, she is my chief <laughs> working uh, group on climate change and as the IFLA delegate to the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. Welcome, Dr. Mercer Clark, and thank you to be here. Thank you, Pedro. Let's see if we can make this uh, actually work. And it would help if I hadn't lost my screen. Don't worry, we can see it. Here we go. Try again. You know, we're, here we go. Ricardo, are we up? Yes. Okay, hi everybody. Yeah. So, greetings from the great white north here in Canada. We're not white, it's 35 degrees out there today, so it's actually a little bit warm. Um, I do have to correct Pedro. I, I chair currently the working group on climate change under the committee for um, policy practice at uh, IFLA. I am a nominated candidate for the chair of uh, the National Committee, but I have not yet been confirmed. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. Uh, so I just I have to stay within the confines. In fact, so, I am nominated too. Our world is heating up. We all know this. Um, according to our best science, we have a mere 10 years left to lower our emissions or to face the intensifying challenges of weather and climate. Uh, we're losing species at an unprecedented rate. Um, forests are burning. Seas are becoming more acidic. Water quality is declining. Fisheries are failing. Agriculture is failing. Communities are burning, flooding, being blown away, and drying up. And people are on the move, migrating toward hopefully a better place, a home in which they can prosper, safe from stress and fight, strife. Um, we are facing a crisis of unimaginable and unknowable scale. And this is what IFLA has been grappling with now for three years through participation of volunteers like the people you see on this uh, uh, conference tonight who are working really for the better good of everybody. Because of this, at the Oslo meeting of the World Council, um, IFLA declared uh, biodiversity and climate emergency. At the Congress, it also committed the 77 nations and all of the members of IFLA to advance the progress on the 17 goals of the UN Sustainability Program. These goals, if you look at them, they are an amazing blueprint for creating a better world. The World Council in Oslo also committed our profession to action on climate change, to reducing our own contribution to emissions from the work that we do as landscape architects, to protecting nature, which is still the best hope for stabilizing planetary systems and helping humanity meet the oncoming challenges, and to preparing communities for disaster from intensifying weather, extreme heat and cold, floods, droughts, and famine. And then came COVID. And everything changed. COVID put the world into seclusion. Societies and economies have shut down. When you add COVID to what we were already facing, all of those challenges are still there. The difference now is we've added a global pandemic. In addition to the loss of family members, COVID has ruptured economies and increased the stress and strife of individuals and populations worldwide. And we are still facing a crisis of unimaginable, unknowable scale. Ricardo asked me to respond to the question of how does COVID change our response to climate change? And what does our post-COVID world start to look like? So that, that's kind of a big question to answer. Do we go back to the way things were before COVID? COVID has proven that not only that pandemics can happen across the globe, but they will happen. So how could we go back to the way things were before? And because of the lag time between the emergence of a new biological threat, a new disease, and the development of successful vaccines and treatment, disease has become a mass, massive new challenge in the planning and design of human communities. As landscape architects, we bridge the gap between the natural and the built world. We know the value of the ecosystem services that support the quality of life in human communities. And we understand the overwhelming costs that would occur if we were to attempt to supply those services only through technology. Decision makers are also realizing that natural assets are assets that require protection and enhancement. Unfortunately, throughout the world, because of COVID, financial and human resources in support of conservation and protection of nature are way down. Recreation and tourism dollars generated by parks and green space have also dried up. And the integrity of those ecosystems is even more threatened. The interdependence of people, parks, and planet is at risk. And this is generating a renewed call for actions that protect nature. 
At IFLA, we are reminding our membership, we are reminding ourselves that we are the stewards of the environment and that we are positioned to be the architects for nature. Luckily, we had already started on a pretty good path. In 2017, IFLA challenged landscape architects worldwide to ensure that their actions reflected three interrelated principles. There's nothing new about these principles. To advance resilience in ecosystems and human communities, to transform society to improve, well, to improve human well-being and to protect nature, to sustain the ecosystems in which our planet, indeed our survival, depends. All we did was really link them. We've known about these for 30 years, and to one degree or another, most landscape architects follow them. But in 2017, we asked you all to recommit to the principles and to combine them in the work that you do and the decisions that you make going forward. In 2019, we declared the Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, we established the SDGs as our guide, and we proposed the Climate Action Plan. In 2020, this year, I'm very proud to say that IFLA was accepted as a member of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, the IUCN. Through this union, we are creating partnerships that will help us make a difference in the world. So our role, our responsibility, landscape architects can be the engine that inspires change in social behavior. Showing decision makers what is possible and practical. And to do this, we need new thinking and we need to celebrate innovation. We need to reach across the other disciplines and professions, the sectors and the borders to create new partnerships and to enhance the ones we already have. Because these problems are wicked problems, they're complicated problems, and one profession is not going to be able to solve them on their own. Interdisciplinary teams are needed to find solutions to existing and anticipated challenges. And above all, we must work to prepare the next generation for their world will be vastly different than the one we know with COVID or without COVID. I was just gonna run you through some of the elements of the action plan, the climate action plan that was approved by IFLA. It has a number of major components. And one of the first one is that every bit counts. All landscape architects everywhere must reduce their carbon footprint. We need to stop cutting trees. And we need to question all of the decisions that we make in our own practice. We must love every leaf. It is very important, it's more important than ever before that we find ways and means to protect all the wild that we have left including all those spaces in rural and urban communities, including even the tiniest little spaces in our cities. We must value every tree we have and we must plant more. And this is not reforestation, this is afforestation. This is planting trees where we have not had trees in our lifetime. And we must promote nature for all. Nature for All is a really interesting program of the IUCN that I fell in love with when I became involved with the organization. It is based on the premise that a personal experience with nature is needed in order for us to value nature. I've known that for years. It can live to a lifelong love with nature that stays with you forever. And I am uh, evidence of that. Nature for All calls on us to create spaces where people can enjoy the natural world no matter where in a city they live, no matter where in a community or in a country they live. We are also working through IFLA to advance understanding of the role played by natural assets, to define natural assets, to value and protect these assets wherever they might be located, and to work toward their sustainable use and management. And one of the aspects of working on natural assets is, and one of the newest buzzwords at the UN, and I do mean it's a buzzword because there are people discovering nature-based solutions that have never worked in nature-based solutions. There are a new approach to an ecosystem-based um, Method, methods for planning and design that merge natural assets with built infrastructure to ensure that the greatest benefits are accrued to both at the lowest cost, possible cost to each. 
Nature-based solutions are providing new and pragmatic means to reduce impacts from severe weather, to reduce energy demands and provide renewable energy solutions, and to capture a wide range of co-benefits to both natural systems and to human populations. Included in those co-benefits are the positive attributes of neighborhood green space, the provision of safe drinking water, and the reliable supply of food. COVID has taught us that all of these become essential to urban dwellers when established supply chains are interrupted and when people are confined at home. We must create the community attributes we need to be well, where we live, because travel to greener spaces may not be the option it was in the past. And one final thing, we must step up to take on this work and we must do it soon. Other professions, not particularly well versed or respectful of natural environments, are already on the move. Nature-based solutions must reflect a real partnership between society and nature, not built into infrastructure with a tree. And lastly, the last component of our action plan on climate change was that we need to innovate to transform and to create, to create. We need to plan and design for the future. Why not build better? Why not dream now and create the cities of the future? Both climate change and COVID ask of us, why not rethink services, transportation, food, water, wastewater, shelter, invigorate urban areas, plan for resettlements of migrants, create space, not isolation, so that we can still interact and be safe. We need to find new solutions, sometimes to problems that may now be on the horizon, but will all too quickly become a way of life, like a COVID pandemic. We need to inter innovate, to transform, to create. And it is not enough to do what we do well. We must do what we have never done before, and then we must do all of that better. In May of next year, here in Ottawa, the CSLA is running its National Congress on a theme of nature-based solutions in a changing world. We're trying to figure out how to do a more virtual meeting and the chance, like this one, in the chance that we still will not have the mobility we hope to have. But please check us out online and think about joining us because we'd love to welcome you here to Canada and we'd love to work with you on these pro problems. Thanks everybody. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mercer Clark. Uh, applausos. Sí, muy bonito. Muy bonito. Uh, yes, uh, in fact, uh, I think uh, we need uh, to think about the in general, landscape architects always need to support the support of science teams, biologists, ecologists, geography, among others. Uh, um, and you as a scientist, consultant and promoter of uh, ecosystem-based approach uh, to planning and design, what do you think should be the changes in the orientation, not only the training, but in the real professional work of landscape architects facing this post-pandemic? Um, I don't think it's so much that our training needs to change, Pedro. I think it's merely uh, a going back to our roots. As landscape architects, we have always been the architects for nature. Um, we, we can get bled a little way away from that into doing hardscape design with our urban centers, but a human urban community is still part of the ecosystem. And we still rely on all of the uh, components of the ecosystem to furnish us with the needs that that community has. So if we as landscape architects look at the work we do in the scale in which we do it, sometimes when you talk about climate change to people, they're overwhelmed by the magnitude and complication of everything that's happening. But if you look at climate change in the context of the site or the project that you're working on, Actually um, addressing the challenges set by climate change, the changes that we, we're going to see in our physical and biological environments, and accepting the challenges uh, proposed by or presented by COVID, is not that much different than the work we do anyway. We're going to, we're going to, you're going to do a site evaluation. You're going to set up uh, a program for that site going forward. And for the information you don't have, one of the things that 
Newer members to the practice cannot remember a time before the internet. I am old enough that I certainly do. And those days for me were spent in a library or on the telephone trying to find an ecologist to talk to, a historian to tell me, a meteorologist who could give me the climate data. Please do that. Everybody that I worked with on the primers, everyone that I talk with as I bridge between science and practice tells me the same thing. They're lonely. They want to talk to people who appreciate their science. They want to talk to people who will use their work in, in informing decision making and creating a better world. They're very act anxious, actually, to, to reach out and speak with people. Um, I will say to the Americans on the board here that when we were writing the primers here in Canada, NASA was hysterical. <laughs> One request for the use of a graphic got a flood of emails to my email box saying, but we have this one and then we have that one and we could do this. So, you know, they not only want to work with landscape architects in the U.S., they want to work with landscape architects everywhere. So it's not so much that we teach differently, it's that we open our minds and we're ready to embrace the other disciplines and what they can bring to inform the work that we do. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Mercer Clark. Uh, this is very interesting. There's a lot of information. Thank you for all of that. But we have to, to uh, go, uh, go further with the, the, the next participant, the next guest. And, uh, and, and I uh, let the people in the audience to make some uh, questions and send it by the YouTube platform. And well, um, now I am uh, really honored to introduce uh, Barbara Deutsch. Uh, Barbara is from United States, uh, is, uh, is a, a BS in commerce from the University of Virginia and masters in landscape architecture from the University of Washington and was awarded by a Lloyd Fellowship at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Uh, she's a, a Chief Executive Officer of Landscape Architecture Foundation, uh, based in Washington. And her diverse background in both private and non-profit sector and prior experience regreening cities from Hong Kong to Washington has been uh, instrumental to help LAF increase the influence and impact of landscape architects to advance LAF uh, mission to support the preservation, improvement, and enhancement of the environment through research, scholarship, and leadership. Thank you very much for me here, to be here. And um, I just uh, read some uh, uh, something you, you wrote for the for the students of Pennsylvania, and it, 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 I, I love that, uh, that uh, words you say, but I thought, how, can, how uh, can we give young professionals the tools, the confidence to make themselves heard by politicians and decision makers? That's the, the thing I start to, to, to think when I uh, read your 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 uh, lecture. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me to help uh, share what we're doing at the Landscape Architecture Foundation to do exactly just that. So let me get it. Let me share my screen. And so I've been asked to talk about um, leadership and what LAF or the Landscape Architecture Foundation um, is, is doing to help cultivate the next generation of leaders. Um, that letter I wrote to the students, we are very concerned with the pandemic and the economic climate um, about this, uh, particularly this class of this generation and don't want to lose them. And so this isn't something new, this is a key strategy for LAF to cultivate leadership and the next generation. So I'll share with you some um, programs that we're doing as well as the value of leadership, uh, the values that we share and uh, what we're doing to help um, develop and amplify the voices of landscape architects. Um, because this is, this is not the time to not do anything, right? This is the time, there are all these 
I feel like I keep saying, well, this is such a moment in time now with climate change, and it is. And then we have the pandemic. It's like, wow, this is another moment converging on top of this. And then we have in the United States uh, reckoning with uh, racial um, inequities and violence. And um, so there is a lot converging now, and it all actually... Um, you know, makes sense because um, these are all things that were issues, but but now being brought to the the fore right now at the same time. So um, we hope that it is a time that uh, uh, it is a call for leadership and a call to use our voice and a um, and even though there's um, a lot of uh, tragedy, we hope it's also an opportunity to do things differently in the future. Whether it's the COVID-19 pandemic or another physical disruption from climate change, if disruption is the new normal, and so how do we lead um, through this to a different future that we'd all like to see? So in that sense, um, we do think it is an exciting time or it's an important time to be a landscape architect we are uh, uniquely trained and talented um, as landscape architects. Colleen mentioned others um, encroaching upon our, our role. And so again, this is the time to feel confident and know that we have what the world needs right now in terms of being designers of the land, designers, the environment and our surroundings. We're human beings. We need other human beings. We need to be connected to other people and we need to be outside. And um, so it's uh, nice to be connected with all of you and I appreciate the opportunity on behalf of the foundation to be here. Um, it is, uh, we're talking a lot about the role of the landscape architect and looking at different ways of practicing um, to help inform decisions that are being made across all um, environmental and social and economic areas. And along with that, there's many ways to practice. So it's particularly the younger generations want, um, that a lot of them are creating their own ways of practicing, creating their own work through different channels and not just a traditional, uh, in the US, like a developer client model. And that's really exciting and innovative. And so we're doing a lot of things at Landscape Architect to help incubate and, and foster that innovation. And then I'll share with you also, I know you all have a declaration and charters, but our call to action that is uh, the founding values for the Landscape Architecture Foundation that we lead with the um, discipline, that it's um, not enough to be a good designer, you need to be an active designer. And um, so supporting action, supporting people's voices, is what we're uh, uh, always have been doing, but doing even more now in a more pointed way. So I'll share with you a little bit about the foundation and um, so you see where this is coming from and some of our programs and then talk about, again, the value-based work and our next initiative, which we hope you'll um, engage with us, uh, we can work together on. So the Landscape Architecture Foundation is a charity, charitable organization in Washington, D.C. We were founded over 50 years ago in 1966. This was the time of the environmental crisis. The rivers were on fire. The air wasn't breathable. And uh, the organization was formed to support the preservation, improvement, and enhancement of the environment. Knowing that designers of the environment, landscape architects, have a critical role to play and helping to come up with solutions. And uh, so we're the only organization, there's other environmental nonprofit organizations that might work at the policy level or the science or with um, advocacy, but we're the only ones working with designers and trying to increase their influence and impact. And we do that through three key strategies, research, scholarships, and leadership. Uh, and leadership is also, um, a quality in which we do everything. So we're leaders in research, we're leaders in scholarships, and we're also leaders in leadership. <laughs> and here's uh, 
just to show of, uh, our key programs, our strategic programs, again, with the goal to increase the influence and impact of landscape architects to make their vital contribution towards solving this defining environmental social issues of our time. I'll share with you a bit of each one. We have plenty of resources on our website and we're available um, to work uh, with you or do webinars. We have um, two of our eight staff are fluent in Spanish and um, several of you have met Megan and Heather um, and they'd be delighted to um, provide uh, webinars or, or support for you. So, um, the, our key strategic area and research is based in landscape performance and we started this 10 years ago with the idea that um, you know everyone then knew what building performance was but no one knew what landscape performance was so um, uh, introducing that uh, concept that we, you know what landscape is um, performance is how something is achieving its intended purpose and if we're trying to achieve sustainability then how is landscape contributing to achieving sustainability mm -hmm. and um, because no matter how you define sustainability you can't achieve it without considering landscape so um, uh, um, uh, sorry Colleen talked about the UN sustain sustainable development goals um, there's all different uh, certification systems sites lead any of the one planet principles I like I like the best I think they're very comprehensive that no matter how you design for to achieve sustainability, you can't, you know, uh, car zero carbon, zero waste, materials, transportation, livability, culture, heritage, land, food, trans you can't achieve it without considering landscape. So uh, we have developed at the Landscape Architecture Foundation, we run a separate platform called the Landscape Performance Series, which is a series of online tools and resources to help uh, designers and agencies and advocates uh, be able to um, show the value of sustainable landscape solutions. So I'll just show you real briefly some of the content there. This is all free and accessible around the world. We'd love, when I show you some of the content, we'd like you to also share any research or case studies that you might have. We'd be glad to promote them. Our case studies, if you look at the, top, at the top there, you see there's four basic components, the case study briefs, the fast stack library, the benefits toolkit, and the collection. The case studies build on LAF's uh, legacy of developing the case study method of research for landscape architecture, and these are digital short briefs, but they have quantified environmental, social, and economic benefits that you show how you got them, and they also have the comparative images of a before and after situation or uh, comparing a traditional or conventional approach to design and development with a landscape architecture approach, and then the quantified environmental, social, and economic benefits. So uh, over 160 case studies um, uh, with all different typologies. Uh, here you can see a dangerous traffic intersection that was made into a beloved uh, public park and reduced traffic accidents by 35% and generated revenue for this small town. Uh, here you can see uh, the Detroit waterfront where uh, the green infrastructure was used to tee up the developer's um, stormwater management plan and also created an amazing amenity for uh, people as well as building habitat um, as well as catalyzing development. And then uh, campuses, uh, schools, uh, giving a landscape framework and identity, looking at the, all the different values, propositions for landscape architecture and quantifying those benefits. So please make use of those resources. And Megan and our, our team can give you this presentation in Spanish as well to really go through the details of how this works and what tools and resources are available to you. So those are the case studies. We also have peer-reviewed published literature that looks at the seminal social and natural sciences to um, provide the proof, uh, the, to show the rationale behind your design decisions, to help a client invest in doing something differently and more sustainable. So uh, we have the headline news and then the full citation for you to look at and reference. 
So here you can see, this seems obvious, but, you know, large canopy trees, uh, asphalt on streets shaded by large canopy trees last longer than asphalt on unshaded streets, reducing maintenance costs by 60% over 30 years. And we've had designers tell us that this has been helpful with them, with the architects and the developers to invest in more tree cover on streetscapes and parking lots and um, get a higher um, lead certification. The social sciences, looking how, uh, this is not just for kids, but adults as well, but especially now in the pandemic, I mean, this has all been there, right? But now you can pull this out and reference it uh, as if we didn't know that when you walk in a park, uh, when kids walk in a park um, with trees versus other urban settings, they're more focused, they're less aggressive, they perform better on tests, on and on and on, all the benefits of uh, nature, as Colleen was mentioning. And when kids have access to well-programmed uh, parks, um, they are more healthy and a more normal weight. There's so there's over, um, uh, I guess I want to say over 150 um, fast facts in our library for you to choose from, and you can sort them by all these different types of benefits um, or typologies. Uh, Lots of research on the value of parks, um, increasing property values. And then also looking at larger scale, what is the value of uh, green infrastructure at a larger scale? And when we look at climate change, you know, reducing electricity use, 7.2% um, uh, due to just having a good uh, street tree canopy. So we have the case studies, the fast facts, and then the benefits toolkit. Um, these are online tools to help you quantify the benefits of your work. So certainly uh, we have the name of the tool, who developed it, uh, the inputs and outputs required, and then an actual link to the calculator for you to use. So work here from the USDA Forest Service about quantifying benefits for trees. I want to, um, anything on vegetable gardens or biodiversity indices, or here's a floristic quality assessment calculator. I want to uh, share this particular tool with you called Pathfinder. It's a landscape carbon calculator, and it was developed by one of the LAF fellows um, from last year. And um, she is on the uh, Climate Alliance with Colleen and ASLA and LAF uh, as well. Um, but it's an amazing tool that, uh, let me show you how it works, okay? and you can link to it from our website. So it helps you become more climate positive in your design. It's a design tool that uh, will do an assessment of what your current design uh, would be for to get 15 years to positive. So how much carbon dioxide it's emitting and how much it's sequestering. And then through some design changes, you can reduce your years to positive. So this would take 15 years to get to climate positive. But by changing some materials, adding more trees and more green cover, which improves the quality of the space, it was able to get your design down to five years to climate positive. Here's another example with the plaza. It's 194 years to climate positive with the amount of carbon dioxide emitted and the carbon, uh, you know, the carbon amount of carbon dioxide emitted. So again, by changing the design to uh, change materials, change amount of impervious cover, add vegetation, we're able to reduce the footprint from, what was it, 194 years to 20 years to positive. Um, so we still have an impact, but we need to uh, work to reduce the impact of our work. And um, this, we have a challenge out to our board and and all the students and everyone we, you know, who wants to, to use this design tool in their practice. So we ask you to join the challenge as well, the Climate Positive Design Challenge, and uh, use this as part of your design process. So those are the components of the Landscape Performance Series. You have the case studies and the Fast Tech Library and the toolkit, and there's a lot of other resources and tools available on there to help show the value of sustainable landscape solutions and a landscape approach. We've taken uh, eight years of expertise in, in this process. It's also a process to include this in your design process and put it into a guidebook for metrics and method selection, which is free and available on our website as well. 
All right, so that's the research side of the house. We also have uh, some research grants. Uh, we'll be announcing a new one in um, uh, August. Um, and I'll move to scholarships, right? So LAF, Research Scholarships Leadership. And uh, we're the leading provider of scholarships for students to help support this next generation. And we also recognize students through our Olmsted Scholars Program. Uh, every, every school selects their best and brightest. They go into a pool and a professional jury picks the winners. The winner receives a $25,000 award at the graduate level, a $15,000 award at the undergraduate level. And then there are six finalists uh, between uh, three and five or six thousand dollars. And we work to build this network of Olmsted scholars. So we have over 800 of them now in 10 years of the program and work to develop their uh, network of support with each other as well as leadership development. And they are the young voices and they give you such hope like it can be really depressing, can it? So, you know, but they, they're so inspirational and you realize, yes, we're leaving this in good hands and we're helping them develop their voice and their skills and their network and working with each other in many ways to um, help make the changes we all want to see. LAF also invests in our leader, our fellowship for innovation and leadership. So we uh, just had finished today our symposium for this group of fellows. Uh, they receive a twenty-five thousand dollar award to dedicate a portion of uh, their time over the course of a year to take a time out and think deeply and and reflect uh, on and develop something that is transformative to practice. It is also a personal transformation to develop their leadership skills and they are there helping each other as well in an intergenerational cohort. So um, we have residencies uh, in DC and uh, because of the pandemic, we had our first virtual symposium. So the good news is, is that it will be eventually, anyone from all over the world can see it. We had over a thousand people today watching and we'll have it on our website uh, in the future, and you can check it out with their ideas. And this fellowship is also open to anyone in the world. So uh, Diego Bermuda and uh, Mandy Colon uh, are, are, rep are coming from other countries to be part of this cohort. So I want to make sure you're aware of this fellowship. And the application is now available on our website. And the next round is due, I believe, in September. So have a look, and uh, we would welcome um, different perspectives from different places. And their year-long work culminates in a symposium that I mentioned that we had today. Okay. All right, so those are our programs. I also said we, um, in addition to leadership and everything we do, we also set an agenda for the discipline in terms of what we need to focus on in order to make our vital contribution to multiply the effectiveness of a limited number of landscape architects in the U.S. Uh, relative to engineers and architects um, and um, really influence the, all the decisions that are being made about the land and about our society. So it, it was born out of the environmental crisis where we had a declaration. Um, Ian McCarg, uh, Grady Clay, Campbell Miller, Charles uh, Hammond, George Patton, John Simons, John Simons developed this declaration of concern, which served as the agenda or roadmap for the profession to help solve the defining, help solve the environmental crisis. And so 50, and at that time we were looking at enhancing the quality of our education system and accreditation and investing in research. Um, again, the purpose to multiply the effectiveness of a limited number of landscape architects. So on our 50 year anniversary in 2016, we hosted a summit on landscape architecture in the future and invited uh, leading thinkers from around the world. Um, I hope uh, several, David uh, was on, uh, Gouverneur, um, uh, Martha Fajardo, uh, Mario Shetman, um, Raquel Penalosa, and, and others uh, from Americas. 
uh, joined us um, to respond to the declaration from 50 years ago and then offer their vision for the future. And out of that, we developed a new landscape declaration. And um, all that was recorded. We had all the speakers. We had 70 some speakers, and you can go to our website and hear what they said. What came out of it was that the key issues were climate change. I know it sounds obvious now, but in 2016, we weren't mentioning the, the climate change words. <laughs> so, climate change is a defining issue of our time and inequity, as well as mass species extinction, consumption, and rapid ur urbanization, and reaffirming our role as landscape architects, as designers of both natural and cultural systems, that we need to be involved and we need to be active designers, um, not just passive. And so, this was our declaration. Um, that I wanted to share with you. Uh, actually, I want to check the time, but um, it's very poetic and it's on our website again, but uh, I'll just read some of the experts excerpts. Cross borders and beyond walls, from city centers to the last wilderness, humanity's common ground is the landscape itself. Food, water, oxygen, everything that sustains us comes from and returns to the landscape. And what we do to our landscapes, we ultimately do to ourselves. And the profession charged with designing this common ground is landscape architecture. After centuries of mistakenly believing we could exploit nature without consequence, we have now entered an age of extreme climate change marked by rising seas, resource depletion, desertification, and unprecedented rates of species extinction. Set against the global phenomenon of accelerating consumption, urbanization and inequity. These influences disproportionately affect the poor and will impact everyone everywhere. Simultaneously, there is profound hope for the future. As we begin to understand the true complexity and holistic nature of the Earth system, and as we begin to appreciate humanity's role as integral to its stability and productivity, we can build a new identity for society as a constructive part of nature. So the urgent challenge before us is to redesign our communities in the context of their bioregional landscapes, enabling them to adapt to climate change and mitigate its root causes. As designers versed in both environmental and cultural systems, landscape architects are uniquely positioned to bring related professions together into new alliances to address complex, social and ecological problems. Landscape architects bring different and often competing interests together so as to give artistic, physical form and integrated function to the ideals of equity, sustainability, and democracy. As landscape architects, we vow to create places that serve the higher purpose of social and ecological justice for all peoples and all species. We vow to create places that nourish our deepest needs for communion with the natural world and with one another. We vow to serve the health and well-being of all communities. And to fulfill these promises, we will work to strengthen and diversify our global capacity as a profession. We will work to cultivate a bold culture of inclusive leadership, advocacy, and activism in our ranks. We will work to raise awareness of landscape architecture's vital contribution, and we will work to support research and champion new practices that result in design innovation and policy transformation. So we pledge our services and we seek commitment and action from those who share our concern and are delighted to um, instill these values in the new generations and all generations of landscape architects. So after the summit, we went around the country and talked to over 6,000 landscape architects and got their ideas for things they're already doing to answer the call to action and developed an action plan. We committed to come back in five years to have another summit. Guess what? That's next year. So we will be having this next summit in uh, September 2021 and preceding that uh, we, I'm going to share with you the idea, hot off the press, so to speak, uh, of, of what we'll be doing to proceed the summit. So we will be hosting a national um, studio, super studio, design studio with all the schools 
uh, or any profession who to focus on the Green New Deal. Um, the Green New Deal is um, a resolution proposed in the House of Representatives in the U.S. as a uh, plan to look at the way we do things in a different way um, at the intersection of climate, justice, and jobs, or equity, environment, and economy, or you know, really looking holistically at solving the climate crisis and doing it in a way that is equitable for all. So we will have design studios, and um, we're leading this initiative in partnership with the McCarg Center and at Penn and the Center for Resilient Cities and Landscapes at Columbia and the American Society of Landscape Architects, convening a national conversation on policy and design to advance design thinking that uh, of equity, environment, and economy through the development of transformative ideas for the Green New Deal. So we'll have this super studio that we'll be announcing in July where university programs and professionals can explore what the green new, the ideas in the Green New Deal for climate jobs and justice would look like on the ground in different regions so that we can develop, um, well, one, increase our understanding, but two, show solutions from a landscape perspective. Uh, we hope that there will be stimulus funding uh, and infrastructure. It's way overdue in the U.S., and uh, when, if and when it comes out, we want to be prepared to have ideas and projects ready um, that reflect, that are from a landscape perspective, not 40-year-old engineered solutions that con put concrete in rivers and, and don't take advantage of the multiple benefits that landscape provides. So we're going to have it, and, and also with COVID-19 and the pandemic, all the students are not at school, right? And they're working remotely. So this studio is also a way to unite them, um, this diaspora of students, to unite them around the, these common ideas together uh, with the studio. And then we'll take the energy and ideas from the studio and we'll put them um, as part of the conversation for the summit that will be held in September 2021. And so uh, with that, we hope to show the power of design to create a healthier, more equitable and sustainable world. And I thank you for the time to share what we're doing. And I look forward to learning more about what you're doing and how we can learn from each other. Thanks. Barbara, thank you very much. This is, uh, well, thank you for the invitation to this super studio and summit. Uh, this is amazing, impressive. Uh, this is amazing work you have done at uh, LAF, and this is very inspiring. So thank you very much. We are on time, so I have to go okay. to yeah. with the, the other guests. But thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Whoa. Um... Now I am very honored to introduce my dear friend Carlos Jankilevich from Costa Rica. Uh, uh, he is a Costa Rican architect specialized in landscape, environmental planning and urban design. Studies, studies pursued in Buenos Aires, Argentina and London, England. Uh, he is chair of agricultural landscape working group at IFLA, interested in cultural landscape uh, biodiversity and ecological regeneration has led important initiatives through its career in IFLA, President of the Americas between 2010 and 2014, as well as uh, present advisory member of the ECOMOS IFLA International Scientific Committee and Commissioner for Central America and the Caribbean. Currently chairs the IFLA World Group on Agriculture and Landscape, author of numerous publications and lecture, was awarded the first research prize at the 2010 CFIA, International Architectural Biennial, co-author of the Latin American Landscape Charter signed in Mexico in September 2018, and he's the director of the Landscape Observatory at the University of Costa Rica and head of Tropica International, frame devoted to landscape architecture and planning, combines his academic and and institutional career with consulting and project development, mainly along Central America and the Caribbean. 
Please be very welcome, Carlos. Thank you, Pedro. Um, okay. Right. So, well, um, today I have I'll be addressing the to this somewhat new topic for some landscape architects or planners, which is the issue of food security. And we are going to talk about a number of things that we, we who are familiar with these topics knew and discussed for a while, but due to the COVID-19 have become somehow trendy or fashionable and also important. So let's begin. Next one. I, I, I cannot uh, move the screen. I think Ricardo or somebody was going to help me. So we have to move to the next slide. How are we going to do this? Hello? Yeah, they yeah are, they are changing there. Okay. Let me see. Okay. Okay. Okay, agriculture and landscape. Let's go to the next one. Agriculture, an activity on which about 50% of the world's population depends for its livelihood, is an important economic force. It is also a way of life, a factor of cultural identity, and an ancestral pact with nature. Within the non values of agriculture are the landscape, the habitat, and its liaison with territorial planning, as well as its capacity to raise awareness about the original communities and our idiosyncrasy. But without a doubt, the most significant contribution of agriculture is that for more than 850 million undernourished people in the world, most of them in rural areas, it is a means to face hunger. Next one. Climate change affects infrastructure, public health, agriculture, the loss of human lives, and other forms of production, further threatening the already fragile food security of human society. Next. Sensitive and aware of this situation, during the international conference held in Oslo in September 2019, the IFLA World Working Group on Agriculture and Landscape, WGAL, was appointed. Next. The IFLA World Working Group was set up in order to create a globally organized team of specialists capable to fulfill the following targets. I'm only going to mention some of them. To establish, plan, coordinate, develop, and oversee IFLA's overall framework in all matters they dealing with agriculture and landscape as to ensure high standards of professional practice by its members. Design and implement a strategic plan for promotion of transformative actions, innovative proposals, as well as to prevent and mitigate current threats to urban and rural agriculture and the landscape, the landscape that identifies them. Also, to develop new forms of management for territorial and food justice as a contribution to end of world hunger. Next one. Other targets were to make an inventory of agricultural history heritage system in each region and nation in response to the safeguarding of agriculture, biodiversity, and wildlife, and the dissemination of indigenous knowledge sources and ancestral cultures. Explore and deepen mutual collaboration opportunities between agriculture, urban agriculture, productive landscapes, public space, and cultural natural heritage. Next. In pursuit of the attainment of these targets, IFLA, WGAL, signed an agreement with IACA, ICA, which is the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation and Agriculture, which is the largest agricultural agency of the Organization of the American States, and now also 
we are negotiating a memorandum of understanding with FAO, which is the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Through both ICA and FAO treaties, we seek to integrate actions in Latin America, the Caribbean, as well as worldwide, in order to generate international, region, regional, and local cooperation. Next. Presently, IFLA encompasses five regions worldwide, hosting 77 actually national and two multinational associations. Next. Productive landscapes. In this way, we aim to spread the concept of productive landscapes as the current social construction of landscape. A landscape whose management, far from exhausting resources, contributes to its production. Next. Food security. Food security is the situation in which all people at all times have physical and economic access to get enough nutritious safe food to meet their nutritional needs and develop a healthy life. Next. Regarding COVID-19 landscape. Next. Portrait of how COVID-19 found us upon arrival. COVID-19 arrived in America firstly in February and then by March. The following is a portrait of how it found us in our region at that time. Next. Facts. I'm going to mention only some of them. Without only 9% of the population worldwide and 4% of its rural population, Latin America and the Caribbean have 16% of agricultural soils, 33% of suitable but not used surfaces for agriculture, 13% of the forest area, and 50% of the biodiversity. Despite such privileged endowment of natural and biological resources, Latin America and the Caribbean must make a call alert since this heritage is subject to a process of degradation which can worsen if there are no major changes. In Latin America and the Caribbean, 40 million people every night go to sleep without having met their minimum food needs. 61% of the inhabitants are undernourished, a figure that in 2019 was increasing for the third consecutive year, whereas in Bolivia, Venezuela, and Nicaragua, undernourishment rises over 15% in Haiti this percentage goes up to 45, and in present Venezuela amounts to 80%. 60 million people throughout the, regional, the region live on family farming, representing 60% of the agricultural effort along the continent. Small farmers, including women and youth, suffer from lack of access to infrastructure, education, and technology. In Central America, more than 60% of family farmers are at poverty level. Additionally, 8.4 of women experience gaps in their food security in contrast with 6.9 for men. Next. So this is the, some facts which are now we can translate them into a more technical data. The red line, of course, is Latin America. And, and the Caribbean, and as we can see, is, is consistently and uh, increasingly uh, growing through the last decades, our population. Next. Prevalence of malnutrition in Latin America and the Caribbean. This uh, chart shows how prevalence of malnutrition uh, by country uh, was seen as uh, from 2014 to 2016. Next. These curves are showing more or less the same. The orange uh, curve is um, the world, and the red one is Latin America and the Caribbean. We can see here the prevalence of malnutrition in Latin America and the world, and the prevalence of malnutrition by region as well as a prevalence malnutrition by regions, which is the, the, 
final yellow line. Next. Child mortality rate from 2000 to 2005, where the, we see the different countries, and then uh, rural indigenous is the orange uh, column, and red is the urban one. So we can see, we are going to see consistently how almost it amounts to the double, the difference between, uh, uh, or inequalities, differences between rural and urban. Next. Next. Prevalence of malnutrition in Latin America and the Caribbean. Mesoamerica has a higher prevalence of malnutrition, affecting up to 10.3 of the population malnutrition prevalence varies widely through Latin America and the Caribbean. Brazil and Uruguay were the only countries where prevalence of malnutrition lower than 2.5 between 2014 and 2016. Prevalence of chronic malnutrition, acute and mortality in minor children under five years, however, in Latin America are decreasing over the last few years. Next one. Poverty, poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Poverty operates as a mechanism of reproduction of gaps between urban and rural and affects access to services basic health, education, and infrastructure, among others. Next. Again, we see the charts, the yellow columns, the, the one at the left is urban, the one at the right is uh, rural, and then we see the increasing by country of the differences, and then summing up the total of Latin America, at the bottom, we see always the same situation, 23.6, for the rural areas, for the urban areas, and a 45.1 for the rural ones. Always the inequalities are double, amount as the double from rural to, from urban to rural. Next one. Same, same thing for extreme poverty. Next one. Now extreme poverty, the yellow column is poverty and the pink one is extreme poverty. Next one. Poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Despite the important progress observed throughout the last 15 years, the rates of poverty and extreme poverty in rural areas of Latin America and the Caribbean represent about 1.2 times and 2.6 times, respectively, the rates from urban areas. The reach of United Nations Hunger Goal Zero in 2030, globally, will need about $265 billion per year in order to uh, be allocated during the period between 2016 and 2030, broken down into 70, 67 million US dollars for social protection and 188 billion for pro-poor investments. Next one. Labor insertion of occupied rural and population. Again, same thing. Next one. Same figures uh, through the bars. Next one. Poverty in Latin America and the Caribbean. Access to food. Price index in nominal and real terms. Blue line is nominal. Green line is real. Next one. Child labor between 10 to 14 years, as for 2015. Again, orange column, rural, red one is um, urban. Next one. So we have a look at what the COVID pandemic, pandemic was through having a picture of who we were and who we still are at the beginning of the pandemic and still now, these figures continue to follow the, the usual trend. The foreseeable end of the pandemic. At some unexpected moment in different regions, countries and communities with various rhythms and fashions in a process 
Through time, finally, the pandemic will come to an end. Next one. Post-COVID-19 challenges and opportunities. Next one. The end of the present pandemic has become a scenario of permanent comment and constant reflection in the most diverse fields, as a result of which possible changes in paradigms and management models are announced and proposed. Next one. The reconsideration we are in this post-COVID-19 return to nature. The reconsideration of human society as part of the species and regarded as just one more inhabitant of nature and not as its owner, appears repeatedly in several of the new and reformulated approaches. Next one. Return to the future. However, the return to a controlled or COVID-19 free, free world will not happen at once, a certain day, but through a considerable process of transitions, I would say, with very different nuances by groups of countries and with a marked impact of the reorganization of the hegemonic groups leading production and international trade. Next one. The purpose of this presentation, for the purpose of this presentation, I will fo focus on the priority issues in which we at the IFLA World Working Group on Agricultural and Landscape are preparing for this transition. So we see when once the, the pandemic starts to 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 end or uh, or becomes or we go through transitions for a different uh, scenario. We are going to go through a number of transitions, and then we, are in, in our group, we are getting ready for this transition, mainly through three uh, main axes, which is change of vision on the rural, emphasis on productive landscapes and alternative forms of agriculture, and continuity of initiatives in progress at the outbreak of the pandemic, with emphasis on regeneration, and ecological restoration, commitment to indigenous techniques, identity and ancestral values, an opportunity for the bioeconomic, the circular economy and the new consumer distribution models. Next one. A change of vision on the rural. From a geographical perspective, the rural is no longer considered as a space of efficiencies and poverty and it begins to be understood as a space of opportunities to transform food and energy system and promote ecosystem services, the conservation of biodiversity, the fight against climate change, and sustainable management of material resources like land and water. Next one. A change of vision on the rural. Latin American and the Caribbean countries faced a complex world scenario with less economic growth, greater volatility, trade restrictions, and with the need to act against climate change. Due to this situation, according to the CEPAL, which is the Economic Committee for Latin America, an additional fund of about six billion US dollars would have to be allocated throughout the region to fulfill social protection needs. Also, another 2,000 million US dollars ought to be allocated in order to support pro-poor produ productive initiatives. Next one. Setting, an strategy, setting up a strategy for food security. The IFLA World Working Group on Agriculture and Landscape poses to develop a strategy based in four concepts. Food disponibility, access to food, use, food use, and stability. We're not going through, to go through them because of time. We do that some other day. Next one.
how to man maintain a sustainable food supply in Latin America and the Caribbean through this transition that we are going to go through, I hope, very shortly. First, promoting sustainable agriculture. Second, decreasing food losses. Thirdly, reducing the gender gap. Fourth, promoting measures of adaptation to climate, change and management of natural disasters. Five, improving access to public and green infrastructure. Four estimates that around a third of the food produced in the world, that is to say 1.3 billion tons per year, is lost before consumption. These losses occur due to handling distribution, storage, and consumer behavior problems. Next one. To improve nutritional results in Latin America and the Caribbean, as part of this transitional strategy we are trying to set up, we have these main points. Designing and implementing agricultural solutions, nutrition sensitive, empowering the women and strengthening this, their social and economic status, implementing condition transfers with appropriate targeting and monitoring, promoting the nutritional equipment for children of children and adolescents with one C, improving water and sanitation services, as well as implementing food safety interventions. Next one. Food security, understood as a way of life in relation to nature, together with the environment, close to new concept of rurality and urbanity, opens up a number of options for the improvement of ecosystem services, environmental health, quality of life, identity and communication. It poses a new relationship for consumer distribution and community production associated with a greater and better employed public space. Culture and the publics is in itself a challenge and at the same time a great spectrum of possibilities. Thank you. Wow, wow, bravo, Carlos, thank you very much. Uh, reality bites. <laughs> and uh, there is a very complex situation in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but I am very happy to hear about this uh, uh, IICA and IFLA agreement. I think that is very, very important. And... Uh, these three points, I, I only want to remark these three points. Change vision of rural, emphasize productive landscapes and community initiatives, uh, setting up a strategy, a food security strategy. Thank you very much, Carlos. I have to go to the next um, guests. Thank you, Pedro. Wow. Um, now, uh, I, I'm honored to uh, welcome uh, Lucinda Sanders from the United States. Uh, Lucinda, first, uh, and, and thank you very much, Lucinda, for accepting to be here with us. Uh, Lucinda first studied landscape architecture at Rutgers University and went to earn a master's degree in landscape architecture from the University of Pennsylvania. She is CEO and partner of Volin Studio. Lucinda Sanders is responsible for continually shaping Olin as a leader in design excellence and sustainability among the complex changes, challenges of the profession. Lucinda is actively involved in multiple boards and committees dedicated to advancement of the field of landscape architecture, urban design and planning, including uh, Landscape Edu uh, Architecture Foundation the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Flower Center Advisory Board, and the CEO Roundtable of Landscape Architects. Lucinda is currently a professor of uh, landscape uh, architecture at UPenn. Welcome, Lucinda. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. And let me say, <clears throat> since I met Laurie Olling a year ago at the Hotspot City Symposium at UPenn, I was pleasantly surprised by the wisdom of that man. And I would like to ask, what does the all-in studio 
think about this incredible new global situation? What is that man's vision now? What do you think will happen in the profession of landscape architects, at least in the United States? Thank you and welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ricardo. <clears throat> Okay, all right. Wait a minute. Uh, of course, I'm not at the beginning. Hold on just a minute. <laughs> um, don't worry, don't worry. Sure. <laughs> Let me try one more time here. Um, so while I'm getting set up here, I'd just like to thank everybody so much for inviting me. Um, I, I need to acknowledge the incredible thinkers that um, have gone before me in your presentations. Um, it's really so, so powerful. Um, so, you know, one of the things about a practice, I think, is how to keep it uh, relevant, right? Um, it's very easy to think of a practice led by a man like Laurie Olin um, as sort of coming and kind of going with him when he retires. And one of the things that I have brought to the practice is really this, this need to keep inventing, the need to um, bring forward the next generation of thinkers. Um, I'm very involved in the Landscape Architecture Foundation and the transformational leadership, the fellowship. Um, this is something that is near and dear to my heart because if we don't invest in the next generation and bring them forward, um, this is um, kind of death for the profession. And so it's something that I am personally deeply committed to. Um, so um, I teach at the University of Pennsylvania as well as practice um, at Olin. And what I really like to talk about are perhaps um, four things in, in our work. <clears throat> and there are four action items. Um, I should, for those of you who don't know, we are a practice of about 100 individuals located in Th Philadelphia and Los Angeles in the United States. And we do work internationally, um, but primarily within the United States. So. Here's, here are some of the things that I'm thinking about um, and was even thinking about well before the pandemic. The pandemic simply underscored the significance of public space in the broadest sense. You know, we, it is where people have come together with the appropriate social distance. So do research. Um, Olin is committed to doing research. We are committed to practice-based research. So, um, Ricardo, when you opened up, you talked about the need for international communication. You talked about education and you talked about practice. I have to say one of the things that Olin has experienced is this gap between practice and education. It seems like all the innovative ideas are in practice, are in, in education. And when people come into practice, the world moves a little bit more slowly. Um, and so one of the things we have done is to try to overcome this is to establish Olin Labs. So advancing the practice of landscape architecture through research, development, and education. <clears throat> and it took us a really long time to make this diagram, but um, so the circle on the middle is about education within Olin, how we keep our information and knowledge building and shared across the studio. 
The next ring is development. It's where we create new tools and processes to enhance our workflow. And then the external ring is what we call the big R research. Um, these initiatives are focused on original knowledge creation. Um, and around the outside of this diagram are um, five labs um, that we have established. People Lab, Build Lab, Eco Lab, Tech Lab, and Design Lab. Um, and this is so important to us um, as a way to close that gap between the academic world and the world of practice. This is just one of the several projects that's going on um, within Olin Labs now. It's called the Soilless Soil development. So sand is being depleted throughout the world at a very rapid rate. Um, and we have innovated this idea of using recycled glass instead of sand in the manufacture of soils. Um, and we have set this up as a research project. Um, we have other research projects that are, are underway um, the Land Care 2.0, building on a vacant lot initiative through the Philadelphia Horticulture Society, sort of bringing it to the next level, not just of tidying vacant lots, but of making them accessible using very simple materials. Um, we're starting a new initiative, and I sort of you know, several of you have talked about the fixity of institutions and how hard it is to move them. We are committed to really studying the um, systemic and persi persistent issues around the Army Corps of Engineers um, and advancing our ability to uh, do more innovative work with them and entice them to move forward. So. Um, do research is uh, um, sort of my important mantra in, in practice. Um, I think another one, and I'm going to just show three projects very briefly. I know we're tight on time. Um, so immerse people in ecology. Um, this is a pier in New York City that we have had the opportunity to design and that it is under construction. Um, it's really just a couple of acres, and I think my point is, no matter how small the project is, it is worth doing everything that we value in that project around um, sustainability, around ecology. Um, uh, probably one of the biggest reasons for doing this, yes, ecosystem services, but I think that the one of the other really big reasons is to educate people, to influence people, to let them know what kind of environment that they are in. Um, so here it is, here's the pier in the foreground against the backdrop of Manhattan, um, just north of Battery Park City. Um, the design of the pier, um, but before I get into that, I really want to talk about kind of the underpinning of the idea of the design, and that is the estuary of the Hudson River that runs along the western side of Manhattan. Um, this whole project was really to um, reimagine that estuary. Um, so we had this idea of designing the pier from lowland to upland um, and developing our aspiration for species that you can see on the screen. Um, we, as um, I think it was um, Ricardo or Carlos who, who you know, um, and Colleen who have all noted that we don't do our work alone. <clears throat> we are knitters, um, so we pulled ecologists into um, the design of this, the recreation of the ecology, and these species are species that we will expect to see um, on our project once it's established. <clears throat> 
Okay, now I've just moved out of my full screen mode. Whoops. Hold on here. <clears throat> this is the one disadvantage to work from home, and that, <laughs> that is not having the tech support. <clears throat> Um, but here is the ecological matrix um, that we ended up with from the lowland to the highland. So a wetland, a maritime scrub, upland, and a woodland. But keeping in mind, this is New York City. So very program intensive. Um, so how do we integrate this intensive program into the ecology. Um, and that is one of the challenges as, um, as our environments become more and more um, populated. So coming um, through the pier, entering the pier, up the walkway, um, and here we are under construction. So. Um, this is what is happening. This is the walkway, and this walkway is meant to move through this recreation of a forest, of um, an upland forest. Um, as I say, it's under construction, so I've knit the visuals into the construction photos. Um, this is one of the upper decks overlooking the scrub shrub area to the right, um, and the construction of <clears throat> the elements that are going to make it comfortable for people. You know, this this little backdrop of a wall is actually screening from the winter winds so that it's comfortable to sit here in the summertime and give views to the southern um, edge of Manhattan. Um, one of the big ideas on our project was to build a wetland. So building a wetland in the Hudson River um, is kind of unheard of. Um, so this is uh, a view of that where people can get up over the wetland. And this wetland is going to be um, sustainable such that it is adaptable to sea level rise. Um, and through the technology of how we design this, um, that, that's how it's going to, to work, as well as the ecological systems that will come in and um, can create deposits in higher areas within the, within the wetland. Um, and so these are some of the construction photos. Um, here you are overlooking um, that wetland and you can see it's the middle of winter. My staff was up there because it could only be built in the low tide. Um, they were up there in the middle of the night sometimes doing construction administration. Um, and what's amazing is that the Spartina grasses are actually filling in. So the system is working. Um, the way it has been designed to work. It's very exciting. This is a high tide image, um, and this is what it looks like at low tide. And so you see all these rocks that we are designed in here all have little habitat in, created in them. Um, so this is one way that we are immersing people in that experience of ecology. And I have to say, this particular client is very education-based, um, and they will be running programs through this peer, teaching specifically the ecology of the estuary of the Hudson River. Um, so my next um, sort of ask of everybody is to design with the flood. Um, this is a project in southern Indiana Louisville is off here to the upper right hand corner. This is a 650 acre park um, and it's a devastated site today. Um, one of the incredible things about this park and the, the park is it's sort of at the um, upper end of the screen. Uh, this is a historic photo. This is a key location in the Ohio River um, it is where the buffalo would cross. It is where the migration happened at the falls of the Ohio. So it has a lot of prehistory associated with it. Um, and, but it has not stayed quite so pure over time. So it's a key location. 
Um, but you see this little dark spot here along, this is the Ohio River, this is Louisville, and this is this dark spot. Like, why was this park space or future space dark? And I'll tell you in just a moment. Louisville has this amazing history of parks, um, starting with Olmstead Park System, and they've just developed this outer Louisville loop. And these dashed areas are kind of those missing links that we're all working on, um, kind of creating, because the river to this point has been a barrier of sorts. Um, and so we had this vision to create this inner loop, knitting Indiana and Kentucky, um, the states on the opposite sides of the river together around um, by using this park as one of those missing loops. Um, there are towns uh, surrounding Louisville, these towns, um, the idea that we wanted to connect these towns um, into the park, so access for all into the park through various means is a key component, and that includes water access too. This is meant to be a very um, robust recreational park um, from hiking to kayaking um, and just hanging out and having a great time. But, so I wanna talk about the flood. This is the park site. This is the great flood of the late 1930s. Um, all, a lot of Louisville and the park site was underwater. What you see in yellow here um, is what happened as a result. Um, the river was put behind levees with the exception of our park site. Um, our park site was actually um, left open to the river, and so it floods. Um, one of the things is the site is incredibly disturbed. Um, it has been excavated, it has been filled on, um, and yet in spite of all of that, um, the nature is coming through. There are emergent lowlands here. Um, there's a robust ecology along the creek that runs through. Um, and this is in spite of all that devastation that is going on. There is something phenomenal about this river, yet it is incredibly treacherous um, when it floods. Um, so this is where the water is when it's low. Um, and again, we don't really you know, know all this stuff by ourselves. We have a robust team that we bring to the table of hydrologists and ecologists. Um, and the hydrologists helped us to understand the dynamics of the river. Um, we did a lot of, you know, as Colleen says, just call people. And we called everybody and pulled information together. And the Army Corps has a very heavy hand in what goes on in the river because all of those wonderful flats that people crossed on up here, um, the river has now been channelized. It has floodgates, it has um, electric uh, plants that um, that operate um, and because the Army Corps honors the navigation the most it is probably their 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 primary focus is the safe navigation of ships through here um, but this little site off to the left um, which is our park site um, really uh, suffers from massive flooding. Um, this is the low level, and this is one of the highest levels, so 35 feet higher. Um, and one of the things that we did was to make this park accessible through almost the most extreme floods. So people can still bike in there, they can drive in there, and not be subject to the dangers of the floods. Keep in mind, it's all sitting outside the levee, 
when waters come up to the levee, the park will be closed then, but we've made this park a place to be even in flood events. This started to inform how we thought about ecology, how we protected it, how we enhanced it. Um, so we are committed to protecting 250 acres of urban forest, creating 150 new acres of meadow and savanna, and 50 new acres of urban forest. So this is a strategy for us. But again, keep in mind, this is for people. And so designing these spaces in the midst of ecology and flooding um, was one of our challenges. And this is just a um, diagram of the program areas. Um, we are committed to um, saving these emergent lowlands and nurturing them into, um, into a more robust forest. Again, keep in mind, these lowlands flood every year. Um, so at some point throughout the year, they're always underwater. We imagine our design intervention here is a very light touch um, to protect that ecology. Um, there are quarries and we are imagining a restored quarry um, waters that people can um, access through kayaks and paddle boats. Um, there are industrial meadows that are um, that are um, imagined restoring these very disturbed lands where the dumping has occurred. Um, and likewise, um, creating sort of some of these bigger places for for gathering. Um, but again, we are trying to bring people close to ecology, close to water, and close to the seasonality of the flooding as shown in this particular image. People can be up over the flood um, that's going on beneath them. So this is, um, I think, one of our um, most robust projects that is in planning right now, master planning. And um, again, I just think that getting outside, um, the pandemic has shown us that being outside is one of the best places to be. It's good for our physical health, it's good for our mental health. And even if we can't be side by side with our buddies, we can at least wave and we can have distant conversations. Um, and so this park is meant to sustain all of that. I think my last message is to get political. I mean, you all are far more political than I am. So when I say this, I feel like a, a neophyte, um, but um, getting political um, when we have a design practice is sometimes very hard. Um, but I just wanted to put forward a project for Fort Collins. Um, in Colorado, we we were retained to do a parks and recreation master plan. We are in the midst of, of that process. And we um, have this um, series of uh, processes that we're following um, with engagement. So we have engaged the community on many levels. Um, we have done a lot of analytic work and we are establishing design guidelines, policy frameworks, and level of service standards that will result in a master plan. But I have to say, one of the things, we kept scratching our heads, and I finally asked the team, I said, would you please make a map as through time of the park system in Fort Collins, because something has happened that's very strange. Um, and so you're just going to look at these series of diagrams um, of Fort Collins sits here over on the right in this dashed area of the park system and how it's grown over time. Everything looks pretty great here um, from up to 1987, the um, open space plan, but then something happens. Parks and recreation and natural areas, like the two different divisions started happening. Um, and, you know, 
it this this was very interesting to us because uh, when I think of public open space, I don't think of it being so divided into multiple categories. And what's happened over time is this divide has continued to to grow. And um, until here we are in 2020, everything in green is parks and rec and everything in this tan color is natural areas. Um, and so what, what actually I was perceiving was, um, and, and Fort Collins loves their out of doors, let me just say that. Um, but what I was seeing was um, the city plan calls for residents to have access to natural areas, parks, or open space within a 10 minute walk of their home, emphasizing existing gaps and areas planned for intensification. So the city had one idea that, you know, it didn't matter whether it was a natural area or parks and rec, they saw it as sort of one system. Yet, um, and we, we were still seeing gaps between places where people did not have access to parks. This was rev revelatory to us. Um, but here's where the getting political mattered to me. Um, and that's in how the city was representing its public space network. Because they were so siloed, everybody's representing it in a different way. This is Fort Collins, the city of Fort Collins natural areas, the trails, the Chamber of Commerce, everybody's looking at this open space, this public space in a different way. Um, and we were suggesting to them that great cities such as Boston and Minneapolis, which have tremendous traditions of park systems, have an imageability of a park system, of a green space, something iconic that people know they know when you say the names of these cities that these parks um, are significant. And we said, what is Fort Collins's complete system? Um, so when I say get political, um, this was not part of the master plan work that we were hired to do, but something I saw that was particularly challenging. Um, so this is how the community services department is set up um, uh, with parks, recreation, parks, planning and development, natural areas, cu cultural services, operational services. And we could actually add off to the side um, water rights, um, stormwater, streets, complete streets, et cetera, we could add all of those because all of those make the, up the public space. And we told them, we showed them this diagram, we said, sometimes when we talk to you, it feels like this, it feels messy and it feels unclear. And how can anybody think of a holistic vision if you're not thinking under one umbrella and one imageability? And so we put forth this public space vision for them to think about um, and to coalesce the power of each one of these individual groups that was having something to say about public space. Um, and so this was a game changer. I have to say, we just presented to the city council and the mayor was so on board. He's like, yes, this is important. Um, and I feel like we had a victory, but again, it's not what our, it's not what we were hired to do. What we were hired to do was to establish some goals and do a parks and recreation master plan, which now we can do now that we've kind of got everybody on, on that right track. So I just want to leave um, you with do research, immerse people in ecology, design with the flood and get political. Thank you very much. May. Oh my God. Oh my May God. God. Thank you very much, Lucinda. This was a masterpiece. Yes. Thank you. Uh, education and practice, laboratories, uh, immerse people in ecology. Wow. Uh, descend, the descend with the flood. 
design with nature. No? Yeah. Yep. So thank you, thank you very much. I am really happy to to hear this, and uh, I am I really appreciate your uh, to you to, to stay with us here. My pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank and I have to continue with the next guest. Thank you. Sorry, sorry for the time. Lucinda, can you take your image up? Oh, this is David. Hola. Okay. Let me introduce my dear friend, David Gouverneur, from the United States. He is an architect from Universidad Simón Bolívar de Caracas, Venezuela, master in urban design at Harvard, university professor at Wiseman School of Design, University of Pennsylvania, 37 years of teaching and professional experience in topics of architecture and landscape architecture, urban design and urban planning. He has been coordinator of the architecture career at the Simón Bolívar University, co-founder and coordinator of the master's degrees in design on the, at the Metropolitan University of Caracas. And many, many important things. I have to, I have to stop, David, because enough, you have a... Enough. <laughs> Tienes un, un, eh, un saber eh, muy, muy grande y muy bueno y te felicito. Eh, gracias por, por estar aquí. Thank you very much for being here with us. And I, I have, uh, I know you have a, a huge presentation, so please go ahead. No, I, will, <laughs> I don't want you to be with a huge presentation. And it's <laughs> an honor to be invited after this uh, group of amazing presenters that have preceded me. Um, I've made a few notes before I go into the presentation because... Um, Ricardo and Pedro had asked me to delve on how can academia contribute to address the compelling issues that Colleen, Barbara, Carlos, and Cindy have shared with us. So I'll be stressing the importance of academia. Second, I think that there's something very important and there's a dilemma that, that's always a pendulum. And it is how much do we give importance to um, research advocacy, uh, policy, versus how much we rely on the design skills of the professions of landscape architecture through design intelligence to address these compelling issues. And I would have to say, and this is my bias, that in the last decade, or at the beginning in this millennia, we've been um, growing in strength, in wisdom, in information, in advocacy. These themes that are so compelling, climate change, afforestation, remediation, um, social inequalities, the end of the fossil fuel era. I mean, this is daily in the press. And thanks for, to our profession, we, it's being addressed, it's being researched. It, but as advocacy is on the rise, I feel that many times the design skills are weakened. And that could be a problem. And that I want to share with you and with the colleagues throughout uh, North America and Latin America. Another uh, aspect uh, is that be, our... Be, be careful with your microphone. I, I don't know what's happened. Another is issue... Your microphone fails. Let me know if it's working. Another issue of our presenters is that they stress the importance of interdisciplinary or cross-disciplinary work. And of course, cross-disciplinary policy and professional work stems from interdisciplinary training. And that's where we have another problem. How do we foster interdisciplinary thinking in academia? And finally, as a gringo Latino from Venezuela, and mm, you stress at the beginning the importance of IFLA, of bringing together mm, minds and initiatives from all continents to together, I will share some of uh, the examples in which cutting edge thinking, education, policy, and design in North America, especially in the United States and at the University of Pennsylvania, is addressing problems of our subregion of Latin America. Okay, so that is the introduction. Uh, as many people have mentioned already, the pandemic already mm, mm, made further evidence of the social and environmental challenges of our region. But also, it's a very malleable and resourceful uh, um, uh, continent. Um, and this has been said a billion times, zillion times, that the periods of unusual events, like the, the, the pandemic, but also of uh, conflict, of um, being impacted by forces of nature, 
they are the best opportunities for introducing new approaches and seeding the change that we're seeking. And of course, uh, the, what the role of academia is simple, is how do we provide the tools to respond to these compelling demands, taking into account the nuances of place and culture. That's, it's, it's no, no special formula, that's it. So I'm gonna try to describe some of the aspects that characterize Latin America. And as a Latino, I think I can see it freely, freely. One, it's still the region in the world with the highest social inequalities and social tensions are in the rise. Second, it's already a highly urbanized region, but the population is augmenting fast. Third, it is the most biodiverse region in the world, but many of these rich habitats are being threatened by, well, forces, urbanization, agriculture, mining, and even infrastructural projects. Another aspect that is very particular of our region is that a very high percentage of the population lives in the informal settlements. I refuse to use the word slums, in self-constructed informal organic settlements. And they're usually in disadvantage in relation to the formal city and occupying high-risk sites. I think it's very important to go through these aspects to try to understand how we address them and which the priority topics are. The other thing is, is that all the American continent is a young continent where the forces, forces of nature are always operating. So these forces affect our infrastructures, the communities, the economies, and even our environmental systems. By the way, my grandparents got married in that church, devastated by floods in Caracas that you see there. We have a very rich multicultural heritage, but we're also very prone to adopting models that come from Europe, from North America, without pondering the consequences of bringing them into our culture. And then we also have a very disarticulated political, institution, academic, and profession responses, each working in different areas. And something that's very particular of our area, corruption, violence, managerial weakness, and a broken legal system. And probably some sign that we're not very proud of being a Latinos, but we always say, si yo estoy bien, que me importa el resto? If I'm okay, who cares about the rest? And that translates into a disdain, disdain for the common good. By the way, in this picture on the left, I took it out of the internet today. This is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, maybe the prime um, urban and landscape problem of modernism in Latin America, which is Universidad Central de Venezuela. It collapsed. Our covered walkways collapsed due to governmental neglect. This was yesterday. So, which are the topics that require attention in this panorama? Well, I established a few lists, and I'm not going to go into detail with the different projects, just to mm, mention some of them and how we've tackled these case studies in different regions and cities in Latin America with students of the United States, of the University of Pennsylvania, and they are always interdisciplinary groups where we have landscape architects, architects, city planners, historic preservationists, and sometimes fine art students and people of other professions. We go to the countries, we work with local uh, teams, with professors, with mayors, with communities. So, for instance, theme number one, fostering urban agriculture, water management, and local economies. And this goes back to Carlos things. This is a major problem throughout Latin America. This is the coffee growing area of Colombia, one of the world producers of coffee. The only problem is, is that these huge areas with 147 municipalities have devastated the tropical forest to introduce coffee that is planted in, under the sun and not under the shade, with very severe environmental consequences. Um, what we're trying to do here is how you can embrace urban development, reconnecting with the ravines and with the agricultural fields. I'm not going to go into detail, but essentially is how these communities, mainly for very low income communities that work the land, engage with the ravines and with the afforestation to gradually introduce tropical forests that will be able to harvest sunshade coffee. In this case, also was very interesting, instead of dealing only with coffee 
and tropical forests for the coffee. It was introducing guagua, which is a Colombian bamboo, which is ideal for cleansing the streams, but it's also a great material to build with in seismic areas. This town was devastated by a quake only about 12 years ago, Circassia. This is another case study of a studio that we just finished working with the Universidad de San Carlos in Guatemala. And as you see, cities, especially in the urban periphery, are a patchwork of gated communities, informal settlements, uh, some tracts of agricultural land that are being lost. And in this case, you see a huge void in the middle. And the only reason that that void was there is that it's one of the few public properties in the entire country. This is a major problem, problem in Latin America. Most of the land is in private hands. So when we have public properties like this agricultural school, this is a great opportunity to foster better agriculture and connect it to urbanity. We can't think of sustainable agriculture if it's not tied to the communities, if it's not tied to urbanity. And Carlos also dealt on this. So these are some of the examples on how we work on it. So we combine environmental aspects, agricultural aspects, urban design aspects, uh, lots for self-construction, special services buildings. Again, all the variables are interconnected. This is another uh, um, uh, project that has to do with uh, forestation and productivity. It is the town of Chamangas in the coast of Ecuador that was devastated by a quake a few years ago. Now, as you see in this graphic here, the main problem of the devastation of the town wasn't the quake, is that the town was built on stilts over very soft um, sediments. And the reason that the sediments were there is that over 30 years, 85% of the mangroves had been eliminated, being substituted by uh, artificial shrimp farming. So here there's a problem of rebuilding the town, yes, fine, uh, going down to the bedrock to create the platforms to keep the population on the water, but the main problem here was a project of mangrove reforestation. Uh, this project, our advisor was Mario Shetman, by the way, who's an expert in mangrove, mangrove regeneration. And we can go on in different aspects, like this case study is in Valparaíso, with the fires that take place every year and with desertification and climate change, this is becoming a recurring phenomenon. Here the problem is, how do we establish a barrier between the eucalyptus plantations that should have never been there and the barrios that are built all in wood, not in cinder block and cement like in most of Latin America. In one evening, 25,000 people lost their homes about four years ago. So what do we have to do? We have to create barriers. We have to provide accessibility because in these barrios without roads, not even a fire engine could come in. We will have to capture water in the rainy season to be able to use it in the dry season and so-so. And we have to replace uh, the eucalyptus by non-combustible local plants. Changing topic, there's a reduction of the disparities between the formal and the informal city. And this has many takes. One of them is how we improve the existing informal settlements. Two is how do we better connect the formal and the informal city. And third, how do we guide the emergence of the new settlements? This is a major topic in Latin America that has to be addressed. We still see our schools and our politicians seeing informality of something that is illegal, that can be stopped, it cannot be stopped. It has to be addressed, it has to be fostered, it has to be helped. This is a case study in Medellin where you see the floodplain of the river, you see the mountain which is rather free, the darker areas are rather unstable land that should not be occupied, and what we see here is an armature that protects the floodplain of the river and creates these green fingers which are pedestrian connections between the lowlands and the highlands. And therefore, in this terrace area, which is ideal for self-constructed neighborhoods, as they do in Medellin, you can walk down in 15 minutes from the higher elevations down to the formal city, down to the um, floodplain of the river and the park and to the public transportation. This is a similar case study that we did in Quito, which is, has the same problem, dealing, uh, for instance, in the connection between the historic district and the very poor neighborhoods that are very nearby, but are completely physically, culturally, and functionally disconnected. Or this project in the south of Quito, in an area called Quitumbe, 
in which there exists a huge urban design public housing project completely disconnected from emergent uh, informal settlements. How can we connect these through recreational areas, bike lanes, footpaths, protect the floodplain and protect the rich agricultural land that's being occupied? Going and maybe making things more complex, we have to address multi-scalar and hybrid responses. That is the themes that I mentioned before at different scales. This is an image of the Colombian coastline, 200 kilometers from Cartagena to Santa Marta. And this is a montage, but what is happening? All the real estate is privatizing the beach with these Dubai-like buildings. Well, they're pushing all informality and the low-income population towards the ecologies at the rear, which of course are polluting the streams that are then polluting the ocean and killing the economic driver that is moving the real estate activity. In this project that I carried out with Professor Richard Weller, and uh, two brilliant uh, Penn students, a Colombian and a Taiwanese, we projected what the Colombian coastline would be in the next 25 years if we followed the trend. And here we see in the black line on the left, all the heavy real estate pushing formality and informality to the rear. Ian McCard would have taken the project and of course would have mapped all the ecological systems all the relation between the mountain ecology and the sea, and through a system of public transportation, we densify, we concentrate population in the pockets, freeing these green corridors from the mountain to the sea. Notice the lower area here, Cartagena, this little dot. When we change scale, then we come into the big Cienega with the big march of Cartagena. We have the historic district in the red, we have the Miami Beach-like hotels in the peninsula, and all the rest that you see here is informal settlements. A million people living in poverty, underserved, with poor infrastructure, with no parks, with no schools. People that go and have fun and get married in Cartagena and go to the beach don't have a clue that this is the other city that is there. And we know that in only 20 years, there'll be another million people in self-constructed areas. And where do they go? in the land that is not filled for urbanization. And what is that land? <laughs> the edge of the marsh eroding the, 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 um, the mangroves. Destroying the ecological system, destroying um, the fisheries, and exposing the areas to, to tidal waves. So what do we do in this case? Well. One, we start dealing with the barrios. This is a barrio Boston, which is right on the floodplain. And as you see, these lines, these striations are there because 20 years ago, people that moved from the countryside to Cartagena, since they did not find land, they had to make the land by filling it with debris, with garbage, with tires. In normal rains, there's one meter in the homes. When there are hurricanes, they're two meters and a half. So these are projects that we're working with reshaping the infrastructure, dividing sewers from sufficient water, introducing mangroves, elevating the level of the homes. But this can only um, keep the population there for probably 20 years, because we know that 20 years after, these um, areas have to move, have to go. Now, where do they go if we don't provide opportunities for self-construction, assembling public land, as we see here on the right, to facilitate the process of self-construction with a landscape, with a botanical armature, they're going to end up eroding the, 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 the mangroves. And they're going to be underwater uh, uh, 25 years from now. And so on, and so on, and so on. This is the same Cartagena. This is the international airport where everybody that visits the city lands. As you see, it deviated a canal that used to keep the balance, balance between salt water and fresh water in the, in the marsh. Well, we know that the airport is going to be underwater in 20 years. It is the opportunity to relocate the airport. And as you see in the right, with a cut and fill operation that you see in the orange and in the black, we are able to create a mangrove park, regenerate the ecology of the marsh, and then create the upper lands for development of lower income and upper income combined. And finally, I finished with this other multi-scalar mm, 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 response. It is the huge metropolitan system of Bogota, a mega city. We will have many of the mega cities in the world would occur in Latin America. And Bogota now has about nine, nine and a half million people. 
but almost all the land in the municipality of Bogota is already taken. So where another 5 million people will live in the next 30 years in the agricultural savanna that you see in the image in the middle. So these are some of the aspects typical to our cities. Again, this is an area of high biodiversity. Colombia is one of the third bi country in biodiversity in the world. But you have these rainforests, uh, the highlands, the wetlands, the different ecological systems that are remnants of patches and they're disconnected. Then we have one of the cities that feeds itself, going back to Carlos, Bogotá is one of the few cities, capital cities in the America that gets about 50% of the food of the hinterland. But what's going on? Well, there is agriculture that is polluting the wetlands and the aquifer, uh, in cattle raising and even flower growing. The entire hydrological system is polluted. The area is becoming impervious and floodings are increasing. And then we come to the city. <laughs> and the city, we have great, beautiful, modern, dense city, but also we have half of the population living in informal informality. And then look what you see in the upper right hand corner. The overflow of population is going into the savanna where you have 30 municipalities where each mayor is doing whatever he wants with no vision, with no territorial vision. And as you see, eroding the agricultural land or allowing for these gated communities, increasing social segregation. I could be giving this lecture using any of the Latin American capitals. So what are we doing as strategies? Number one, and going back to the different remarks of our people that came before me, one is to create a green system, a territorial system that comprises the patches of ecologies, the enhanced ecologies, agroforestry. Look at this image that you see there on, on the right, which is in China, but it could be Central Park. It is preserving the green heart of Bogota in the area where we can bring back the ecologies, enhance the wetlands, and also the figures indicate that Bogota requires another 10 parks the side of Central Park to deal with the population. They have only Parque Simón Bolívar. So here what we're creating, as Cindy said, the icon of the city is a green heart. And one of the reasons that it's good is not only that it's by the river that floods, but it's in the flight plane of the two air airports. So it can't be urbanized anyway. So there are many reasons for this green heart. Uh, second is how do we increase the density? Here in gray is the existing city. In white, the other four or five million people, you see the green heart and in lighter green, the protection of the area, which is the best agricultural land. That you have to kill for, but we can't do it if we don't have a system of transportation and investments and incentives to bring the, the population who are on that white band and not being dispersed at low um, densities throughout the system. So how are we dealing with an improved uh, agricultural, defending the rural landscape, and in the case of Bogota, which is very typical, one of the motives of the economy is the production of flowers that are being relocated next to the new airport. And finally, of course, there's the balanced metropolitan system with things that are the checklist of any sustainable city. Public transportation, polycentric development, socially integrated, and the green armatures that go through the urban fabric and tie to the habitat system and to the agricultural system. And of course, um, you have a big vision for this, is the macro scale, but in order for this to work, you have to go into very detailed proposal of the different components. And what do you have? Well, <laughs> the combination of one, two, three, where Habitat, agriculture, and urbanism work as a system. These are topics that we have to address in academia, in policies, because they're the, the main issues that, America, that Latin America is facing. And of course, the priority to be able to achieve these ideas is interdisciplinary training that will improve professional practice, community engagement, and something that beats me how we're going to do is a non-corrupt and more qualified political, political leadership. So, closing. The goal has to be improving the quality of life and a healthy environment. That has to be the goal. Interdisciplinary and multi-scalar efforts are barely, badly required. And we need design intelligence and planning and design through 
to address through the spatial organization, through the morphology, through things that landscape architects know how to do, how can we sustain the ecological, economic, social, political, productive, political, and so on processes? And finally, it's uh, good to know that although these themes may be common throughout the world and throughout our, the region, uh, there are no common, um, uh, no silver bullets. The challenges are similar, but there are no generic responses. They have to be site specific. Gracias. Bravo. Another masterpiece. Thank you very much, David. We are very, very happy to, to have your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, okay. Thank you very say, much. I just want to say one, one thing. Sure. I am not trained as a landscape architect. I'm an architect, I'm a city planner and urban designer. But after 20 years at the University of Pennsylvania and co-teaching with my friend and colleague, Cindy Sanders, I am the first advocate for the power of landscape architecture to address these problems. <laughs> but let me tell you, most of all, you are a landscape architect. I remember you walking in the Pedregal at the university and you uh, start talking like a Humboldt or something like that. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. Um, I just want to say that uh, David told me in the morning that maybe we have to plan and design more for the people in difficult conditions from now on. So thank you very much, David. This is uh, another uh, impressive uh, presentation. And uh, I have to, to end this uh, uh, presentation. Uh, but finally, I'm honored to introduce and welcome Andrea Padilla from Costa Rica. She's going to present a short and reflexive uh, uh, presentation. And very quick, uh, and there Andrea Padilla from Costa Rica studied agronomy at the National University of Costa Rica and has postgraduate degree in rural development from the same university. She also studied anthropology at the University of Costa Rica. Andrea has worked in agricultural research and extension at the National University in areas related to alternative agriculture, rural tourism. She also worked at the Central American Agricultural Council of the Central American Integration System as a specialist in regional integration and rural development. She currently works at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations as National Coordinator of the Mesoamerica Without Hunger program in Costa Rica. This program aims to strengthen the institutional and political framework for family farming food and nutritional security and rural development. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea, for being here and welcome. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Mm. Are you seeing my screen? Mm, not now. No? Okay, let me see what happens. And let me say that uh, I receive a lot of WhatsApp. <laughs> My phone is just uh, burning. Uh, uh, I think there is a lot of people very happy to, to see this uh, beautiful okay, now? presentation. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, I will make a brief reflection about post-COVID landscapes. FAO is the specialized agency of the United Nations that leads international efforts to defeat hunger. And our goal is to achieve food security for all. I will focus on productive landscapes. As we have seen, COVID-19 crisis has made us rethink the future in many ways. Both lives and livelihoods are at risk right now. Moreover, the pandemic came at a time when food crises were already here, let me pass. Okay. As Carlos already explained, what is food security? I'm just, uh, just going to refer to some general implication of the COVID-19 situation for food security. The pandemic is already affecting food systems directly to impacts and food supply and demand. The state of food security and nutrition 
was already alarming before the outbreak of COVID-19, an estimated average of 821 million people was undernourished between 2016 and 2018, and most of the world's hungry people live in low-income countries. These figures are expected to aggravate as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, with the poor people living in remote areas, migrants and informal sector workers, people in humanitarian crisis and conflict areas, and other vulnerable groups likely to face the worst consequences. Also, as the pandemic slows down economies, access to food will be negatively affected by income reductions and loss of employment, as well as availability of food in local markets. Nutrition is likely to be affected as people shift diets to more affordable, as well as more shelf-stable and prepackaged foods, and as fresh fruits and vegetables become less available due to panic buying, and disruption in food systems. So what is the role of productive landscapes in food security and post-COVID-19 recovery? This pandemic also raises the alarm on the urgent need to transform the world's food systems. Globally, food systems remain a driver of climate change and the planet's unfolding environmental crisis. Therefore, there is an urgent need to quickly rethink how we produce, how we process, market, consume our food, and dispose our waste. This crisis can serve as a turning point to rebalance and transform our food systems, making them more inclusive, sustainable, and resilient. Sorry. Agriculture landscape or productive landscapes are multifunctional and provide different goods and services to different stakeholders. This means that managing ecosystem and socioeconomic issues at landscape scale supports the integration of social, economic, and environmental objectives. To eradicate hunger, landscape approaches across diverse production and conservation areas has have often proved useful for development, developing and maintaining sustainable agriculture and food systems that reconcile production needs and that ecosystem functions and services that support them at multiple scales. This makes landscapes approach essential to support sustainable food and agriculture and build resilient and productive social ecological systems. Agricultural landscapes can also increase local food production. In this context, we must also redeem urban landscapes. Edible landscapes integrate productive and edible plants into ornamental plantations and conventional designs. They are an option for traditional landscaping that empowers people to produce their own food and local food. All open public spaces offer some opportunities to develop edible landscapes. Thus, as far, we consider that post-COVID-19 productive and edible landscapes or agricultural landscapes should be fair and inclusive, in which small and family farmers obtain enough income to improve their living conditions and access social protection programs, promote economic empowerment of women and other vulnerable social groups, also, special attention should be given to the inclusion of young people who have a central role in leading the transformation need, needed in food systems. They also need to be environmentally sustainable, contributing to a low carbon economy by promoting local agriculture, restoring productive landscapes, promoting the recarbonization of soils, and the rescue and conservation of ag agrobiodiversity. Mm, landscape also need to be culturally relevant, in which the different logics of production, marketing, consumption, and food, par food patterns of indigenous peoples and other local communities are recognized and valued, ensuring their food and nutrition security, but also recognizing their symbolic value to facilitate the access of these cult culturally relevant 
products to a specific market. And they also need to be innovative and with access to different technologies. An example of these landscapes is globally important agriculture heritage systems. We are exceptional landscape of visual beauty that combine agricultural biodiversity and ecosystems and cultural heritage. They are located in a specific sites around the world and they provide multiple goods and services, food and livelihood security for millions of small scale farmers. Mm, but these agriculture systems are threatened by many factors, including climate change and increased competition for natural resources. They are also dealing with migration due to low economic viability, which has resulted in traditional farming practices being abandoned and endemic species and weeds being lost. These ancestral and cultural systems established a foundation for contemporary and future agricultural innovations and technologies. Their cultural, ecological, and agricultural diversity is still evident in many parts of the world, maintaining as unique systems of agriculture. Uh, in this context, FAO is leading efforts to improve food security and nutrition through integrated approaches on the ground. These initiatives are based on the rest, resilience and social equity, equality of communities and preserving the natural resources base upon which all food production depends. Important dimensions of food security such as health and nutrition are usually addressed through social policies and interventions which are disconnected from economic and development policies. We need to improve food security and nutrition to integrated approaches on the ground, like productive or agricultural landscapes. Also, the One Health approach that means recognizing the connection between humans, animals, plants, and their shared environments in an integrated effort to reduce disease and pest threats and ensure safe food supply. Well, these were the general ideas that I wanted to share with you. Mm, it was a very short presentation. We know we can meet the challenge of ending hunger and support sustainable livelihoods of people and communities who produce food. However, to be successful, we must simultaneously address challenges that are both natural resources based and socioeconomic. In summary, we need to accelerate, I think we need to accelerate movement toward productive landscapes that are more resilient to future pandemics and that offer better protections for all. Mm, the goal should be productive landscapes that are in balance with the needs, needs of the global population and the limits of our planet. That's all. Thank you, thank you You're very fine. much. Andrea, it, it was really, really nice, uh, not only productive, but beautiful landscapes. And uh, again, the role of productive la landscape, you know, food security, edible landscapes, and again, agricultural heritage systems. Um, very interesting and very important, Andrea. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to pass the microphone to Gloria Ponte for the conclusion of this uh, meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pedro. Uh, well, what could I say? I am amazed <laughs> uh, of this uh, dense thinking. Okay, uh, I bring a warm greeting for you from Colombia, South America, specifically from SAP, our Colombian Landscape Architects Association, which is near of its 40th anniversary. It's old, but small. Uh, it is a great honor for me to be in this group of outstanding representatives of several fields of our discipline, the landscape architecture. Uh, and after all these uh, exciting presentations, I feel more honored even. Uh, this is a very special moment and a quite motivating experience to realize that we are shaking up and tightening our north-south 
or let's say English Spanish Portuguese relationship. The South, the richest and the poorest, as David and Carlos have demonstrated us this afternoon. It is said that, that crisis is a good presage, and we are now in the crisis of the crisis because we were already in climate crisis, but now we are in pandemic crisis. Uh, undoubtedly, this uh, global experience is, is a good point to restart. It has made us to reflect in many aspects of our individual lives and also in all the scales of our common life. Among other lessons, we have realized that development is not the paradigm anymore. We, from the southern part of the world, have been persistently, persistently wishing to follow the development line from the northern hemisphere. But it is time to stop. We have made a mistake. The crisis is precisely in the environmental degradation derived from our production and consuming systems that have revealed that natural exploitation is unsustainable. The easiest things are the more difficult to understand, accept, or at least remind. I keep telling my students, hey, water comes from the top to the bottom, mainly to architects who used to draw from bottom to top. As the uh, Landscape uh, Architecture Foundation says, we believe in the power of design to create a healthier, more equitable and sustainable world. And this is what we have to keep doing and with more force now and onwards. How should this design be guided? Uh, Colleen and uh, Barbara have given us responses. Uh, um, Colleen says, uh, we have to be stewards of environment and we have to inspire the change. Barbara said that we should be active designers and it was demonstrated by Lucinda. I bring two points of how this design could be. One is the cradle to cradle philosophy, not just sustainable development goals. No, not just that, because that is focused on development. Neither the three are reduce, reuse, recycle. Cradle to Cradle was an idea started in 2002 and is based on concepts, intuitive concepts, and rooted in imitating nature or better, in an honest connection to it. It means reflective and respectful connection. It is mandatory to keep this in mind before drawing the first line of a new design. My second point is, of course, education. As David said, it's my bias. I would like to renew the proposal that we join efforts towards the formation and qualification of new landscape architects in Latin America. From the 20 associations in the region, it means 19 countries plus Central American group, seven of those 20 do not have a single landscape architecture program, and six countries have just one program. It leaves just seven countries where landscape architecture architects can be formed and over the, our, our uh, wide diversity demands much more. We need to revise once more and resume efforts that were made before towards this matter and basically make the compromise of widening this formation opportunities. As Lucinda says, if next generation is not formed, landscape architecture profession will die. From the capacity building IFLA working group, which is part of the EAA committee, Education and Academic Affairs, I keep myself 
in promoting and organizing courses for educators' capacity building with the proposal of training lecturers to lead new solid schools or to improve the quality of existing ones. The Northern countries have a lot to offer in this line. As well as we keep on looking at our roots and looking at our identity, uh, reminding that we are the richest but the poorest, but we have a lot to learn about, uh, to learn from northern landscape architects as uh, the, the friends that um, spoke today. Then let's walk together side by side, north and south, English and, Port and Spanish and Portuguese sides of our Ipla Americas region to our common future. Okay, thank you. Now, I have to pass to read some uh, greetings. Uh, for example, from uh, Ana Luisa Artesi. Uh, she uh, greets especially Carlos Yankilevich uh, about the complete and uh, very good speech. Uh, Paisaje Vivo uh, says congratulations and thanks for this wonderful encounter. Very proud of our profession. Colin Barba says very interesting work, both climate change and uh, LAF. Greetings from Buenos Aires. Gabriela Wiener, excellent, uh, excellent conferences. Thank you. And Maria Bellalta from Boston says uh, it is true that distance are in our imagination. The continent seems near with this encounter. And uh, mm, greetings from uh, Peru. And there is just one question uh, from uh, Megan Barnes from Washington. She asks, how can landscape architects influence on uh, influence on or promote policy changes in their cities, municipalities, and countries? Uh, I would like to, to pass this question to Colleen. I I repeat: How can landscape architects influence on or promote? policy changes in their cities, municipalities, and countries. Please, Colleen. Thank you, Gloria. Um, thank you, Megan. It's, it, it, that's a great question. And in view of today's world, where so many are marching um, for change, um, one of the ways that landscape architects can get involved, and certainly we encourage it here in Canada, and it's a large part of the work I do as a volunteer now on behalf of the profession, is to um, participate with your local national association. Um, the CSLA in Canada acts as the voice of landscape architecture. And we uh, weekly, if not daily, are advocating through meetings with federal and provincial territorial um, organizations and governments uh, for the kinds of change that we see to be important and for the need to uh, to really bring insightful design into the process. Um, I am right now sitting on two different advisory committees as a volunteer. One is on, uh, I managed to get it down to planned retreat because I don't like either one of those words. Um, and the other one is on redefining uh, nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, etc. It's really, really important that the landscape architecture voice is heard in these dialogues. Um, one of the consultants in the re in, in repatriating these the uh, repatriating these definitions to Canada was asked, "Well, how would you describe green infrastructure?" And he said, "That's when you plant trees on an engineered dike." <laughs> So, uh, our voices need to be raised loudly and with 
a good uh, principled discussion, but also to be able to advocate for good design. The other way is I, IFLA is always looking for volunteers. So that comes from the national organization down. Um, at the local level, um, your communities need you and your voice can be used again at public meetings, uh, at planning commissions, um, by educating in schools and in local colleges and universities. There are many, many ways that the voice of a landscape architect can be used to advocate for change outside even of the design practice or outside of the environment in which their client has, has you know, presented to them. Okay, thank you, Colleen. Uh, I, I dare to to give a reply to that question. Uh, we actually are near to start a course, a short course, 100 hours course, uh, online of course, in this time, for a, a course called uh, Introduction uh, to Landscape Management, and it is uh, drawn to, to uh, administrative staff and uh, we we are already uh, we have already people registered for that diploma and it's, it's the the little uh, sand grain that we can put uh, we would like to listen the other guests the other speakers about this this um, question but please short if you can because we are out of time please who, who would speak Barbara thank you. Hi, I just like to speak briefly thanks so much um, I think just uh, Following on from what Colleen said, there's many ways to practice and many ways to act, but the key thing is to use your voice. And um, we can leverage and optimize the limited number of landscape architects through technology and through writing. Um, write uh, for the, to the newspaper, um, use your social media channels, um, uh, conferences such as this, push them out. You know, I, the point is just to start the conversations and keep the conversations going and um, you, yeah, use your voice in many different ways and however that would suit you. But just, this is not the time not to say anything. If you're not gonna say anything now, why bother? So make an extra effort to get your voice out there. Thanks. Thank you, Eva. David? Perhaps the only thing that I would add is that in a way, in the line of Cindy, that if our proposals, our ideas embed the political vision, if part of the design and the planning effort already um, understands what the politicians are after, how we present them in the words, in the ways that they're attractive to them, that they can de de deliver it in very brief times, because many times the planning and design process is not that the same pace of the political decisions, which are very quick. So mm -hmm. we have to be able to train to give response that is mm, sound good to the ear of the politician and also respond to the political timing. Okay, very good, thanks. Someone else? Linda, Lucinda. Sure. I think one of the things that I always look for are opportunities um, for bringing my voice forward. And I would just recommend that as a strategy to people. Um, find like-minded people um, because that's where the seeds will germinate is in fertile ground. Um, I just, to keep going on the Fort Collins story for a minute, um, when the mayor sort of was enthusiastic about this idea, 
Um, after that meeting, I reached back to the folks who are our client and said, okay, now who's going to step forward and lead this process? Who is going to be the shepherd of this holistic vision? And my client was like, well, this has fallen on deaf ears before. And my whole point is, this is the moment, like, we know now how valuable public space is because of the pandemic. The mayor has just endorsed this idea. Um, and so this is what I mean. This, while, while resistance may have been met before, seize those moments, seize those uh, moments of kind of people coming forward and wanting to work with you or um, help envision your idea. So I, I have a little bit of leadership training to do of my client. And I don't mind doing that. Um, and this is, I think it's important for all of us to help guide the folks we're working with, politicians, clients, whomever. Okay, thank you. Carlos? Thank you, Lucia. Yeah. Something to say? Something to say? Well, a lot to say. Well, I think, <laughs> um, I, I think that be, be, if it is a local government, like a municipality or so, I think that becoming involved with the if you are already a member of the community or if you are, is the place where you live, if not, you can even though come, come close to what is happening there. And I think that uh, togetherness, I think that being, being a part of the group, the, we landscape architects have our uh, a, a different vision and then uh, and a different sensitivity to what's going on so being part of the group and uh, being there in an attentive manner. So if if uh, I think probably there is, I mean, the, the normally the good ideas are there, the needs are there. So be attentive and sensitive enough and togetherness, I think, and being a member of the group. And then you, you take uh, your own vision and, and your own voice, as my colleagues were saying. Okay, thank you, Carlos. Okay, I have just to say an enormous thank you to all these generous speakers and uh, thank you to, to the audience and thanks to the organizers and mainly to, to the great speakers. Thank you very much. Let's work together. North and South. Keep keep together. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good thank you very really soon. Yes. Bye bye. Bye. Take bye. care, everybody. Bye. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. It's hard to hang up. <laughs> 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 no one wants to hang up. <laughs> bye. Bye-bye.